Interestingly, the judge. All right, looks like they're going to begin now. You can see that the people coming to the podium there uh, waiting to see what they have to say. All of this just breaking this afternoon in Dane County, where a judge has pretty much put the brakes on the voter ID bill, the photo ID, and what that means to uh, thousands, millions of voters here in the state of Wisconsin. As you can see, uh, James Hall there with the NAACP, he is about to speak right now. Let's in, listen in to see what James has to say. Good afternoon. Welcome to this press conference called by the NAACP Milwaukee branch and Voces de la Frontera with regard to the voter ID lawsuit pending in Dane County. I would like to um, first of all acknowledge Reverend Williams and um, St. Mark Church and thank uh, the church for allowing us to have the press conference here. And I would like to start by um, making a reference to the historical significance of having the conference here. In 1865, Ezekiel Gillespie, an African American who was a former slave who had been born in the South and found his way to Milwaukee, was turned away from the polls when he attempted to register to vote in Milwaukee's seventh ward. Wisconsin voters had approved a referendum in 1849, a year after Wisconsin became a state, which would have allowed black men to vote. But there were those who took the position that this was not valid and attempted to take that right away. Well, Ezekiel Gillespie knew that that was wrong. He took the election inspectors to court. His case was immediately advanced to the Wisconsin Supreme Court where the court ruled unanimously in his favor. That was in 1865. Now, Mr. Gillespie was one of the founders of St. Mark uh, Church here. He showed that if you take action, things can happen. It's a shame that here we are, 100, almost 150 years later, and we are still fighting those same battles. But this is a great day for the NACP and a great day for Voces de la Frontera, and it's a wonderful day for the citizens of Wisconsin. And by that, I mean all the citizens, uh, the elderly, uh, minorities, uh, non-English speak speakers, students, and others. We know that it is not over. We must be diligent and we must be persistent and uncompromising in our efforts to protect this most fundamental right, the right to vote. Now, we're going to have several other speakers, and our attorney, Richard Sachs, who we are grateful to, uh, will speak about the legal implications of this uh, judge's uh, denial, I mean, granting of, of our motion for preliminary injunction. But at this time, I'm going to call upon our partner, Christine Newman Ortiz, Christine Ortiz, Newman Ortiz, who will, um, who will, who will make some remarks, who will be followed by um, Attorney Sachs. Christine. Thank you. Justice has been served uh, for the over 200,000 voters uh, that would have been denied um, their right to vote under Act 23's new voter ID requirements. Uh, Voces de la Frontera and NAACP are two civil rights organizations um, that recognize we are the inheritors of uh, other generations that came before us um, that fought to bring about uh, voting rights, um, the Voting Rights Act in this country. Even as I speak today um, in Alabama, there is a march commemorating and the Selma to Montgomery uh, voting rights march. Uh, because voting rights are under attack in this country um, and they're under attack in Wisconsin. Uh, Judge Flanagan's uh, decision was an affirmation of the sanctity of voting rights um, and a recognition of the level of credible evidence um, that was brought to the courtroom uh, through the partnership of NAACP and Voces de la Frontera in um, 
in being out there to bring affidavits of voters uh, who struggled in what is essentially a contemporary poll tax uh, to acquire the, um, uh, the new uh, photo ID as well as um, through the, the voters themselves, as we have here present, um, that we're willing to take that stand uh, and try to get the photo ID to overcome uh, tremendous, um, uh, tremendous barriers, as well as what the cities of Madison and Milwaukee did uh, to document the disenfranchisement. Uh, so we know that justice uh, does not come easy, um, but we are here to defend, um, as the inheritors of voting rights, we're here to defend those rights and to ensure access um, for all of Wisconsin voters. And let me just say, so you'll know the full order of uh, speakers here, and I should have said at the outset, I'm James Hall, president of the NAACP Milwaukee branch. Um, we will next have Attorney Sachs, Richard Sachs, who's our counsel, who will be followed by Alderwoman Malele Coggs and then Supervisor Nakia Harris. Thank you. Thank you, James and Christine. Um, the first question I was practically always asked by the media and other and others inquiring about why are you challenging photo ID is why, why are you challenging this? ID is required for all the basic um, things that people have to do in a modern society from getting Sudafed to getting on a plane um, to, um, you know, to any kind of sun, every, everyday activity. And the issue here isn't, um, you know, um, what's required to make it. The issue here is the right to vote and the Constitution. And the constitutional right to vote is a fundamental right under the Wisconsin Constitution. And it's even more than a fundamental right. It's what we call a preservative right, what the courts have called a preservative right, in the sense that without, without this right, all other rights in our society would be rendered meaningless. The right to participate and be involved in the, in our society and the political discourse of our society would be rendered meaningless without the ability and the right to exercise the franchise. We should be proud to be here today at this church, um, which was founded um, by a man who in 1865, at the end of the Civil War, filed a lawsuit that went all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, affirming the right to vote for African American voters in the state of Wisconsin. And but this case today that Judge Flanagan decided, while if you read the decision, there's a lot of citations from different cases going all the way back through the 19th century and even going up through the 20th century in the United in US courts and Wisconsin courts. This case ultimately, ultimately, it's really not just about the law. That's not what Judge Flanagan exclusively relied upon. What he decided this case upon was the experiences and actual real life problems that hundreds of thousands of voters in the state of Wisconsin were subjected to by the requirements of Act 23. And the case, it's about real people. It's about people who are here today, like Ricky Lewis. Where's Ricky? Ricky, who's a honorably discharged, honorably discharged US Marine in 1975, who this year tried to go get his photo ID so that he could exercise the right to vote. And he was told, oh, you can't get your photo ID because you don't have a social security card and you don't have a birth certificate. So we went down to try to get his social security card and they said, oh, you can't get your social security card because you don't have your, drive because you don't have your birth certificate. So we went down to the, to the Milwaukee County Courthouse to get his birth certificate. They had no record. They had no record of Ricky's, of, of Ricky's birth. So Ricky wrote away to the state, to the state's division of vital records asking for his birth certificate. He sent his $20 to get his birth certificate. His birth certificate came back several weeks later. The name on the birth certificate didn't say Ricky Lewis, it said Tyrone DeBerry. Tyrone DeBerry. Tyrone was Ricky's middle name when he was born. DeBerry was his mother's maiden name. He was informed to get your correct birth certificate you have to file a court action in Milwaukee County Circuit Court to correct your birth certificate. Ricky Lewis said, I'm not gonna do that. 
that's an unreasonable burden on me just to exercise the right to vote. And he decided to join with the NAACP and VOCES to challenge this law. The case is all about, it's also about a woman by the name of Carolyn Anderson. Carolyn moved here from Mississippi with her four children this summer. And she tried to get, she tried to get a photo ID so she could vote here in Wisconsin. She didn't have her birth certificate. She's written three times to the state of Mississippi to try to get her birth certificate to no avail. She's now unavailable. She can't vote in Wisconsin elections. This case is also about a woman named Danetta Lane, who's one of our plaintiffs, who tried four times to go down to the, to the DMV office to get her birth certificate, ended up waiting a total of approximately 12 hours, ended up having to get a birth certificate where she had to pay $20 for you. some of us, that may not seem like a, like a burdensome requirement, but for Ms. Lane, who's a mother of four children, all under the age of seven, who lives on a inc monthly income of $560, that $20 she had to spend was a substantial burden. It was $20 that she spent that couldn't go to her rent or food for her children. That's a substantial burden, and that's the kind of burden that Judge Flanagan understood and felt was a real burden that is a modern-day version of a poll tax. The judge heard and understood the stories of these people. He also understood that these people, we submitted 40 affidavits to the judge of similar circumstances as Ricky and Danetta. But there are also not just those 40 folks. There are 200,000 voters in the state of Wisconsin who currently lack photo ID acceptable to vote. When we had our primary election, the newspaper accounts were full of stories. Oh, there weren't that many people affected by the photo ID requirement. But we know that there were 200,000 people out there who knew that if they went down and tried to vote, they would be turned away from the polls and they self-selected. And rather than going down, they understood that they couldn't vote. And as we have elections coming up of increasing um, voter participation, of increasing profile and um, political significance, um, that 200,000, that group of 200,000 voters will be disenfranchised if this law were allowed to go into effect. And that's why Judge Flanagan enjoined the law. And it was a correct decision on his part. The judge also understood another important point, that the reason the legislature gave in passing this law was ostensibly to, defer, to deter and prevent fraud. The judge heard very compelling evidence from a UW political science professor, Kenneth Mayer, who investigated and looked into the three last investigations, official investigations we've had here, here in the state of Wisconsin during the last decade, investigating examples of fraud. Not a single example of fraud, whether it was felon disenfranchisement, or whether it was a felon who voted, or whether it was a question of absentee, um, double voting absentee ballots, or whether it was a question of procuring false voter registrations. None of those voting irregularities, not a single one, would have been prevented or deterred by the photo ID law. So the whole purpose of this, legislative purpose of this law to defer fraud is a sham. And it does nothing to prevent and deter fraud. Finally, the judge also understood that this law that we have here in Wisconsin is the most stringent strictest voter ID law in the whole, in the whole nation. Unlike other, state, unlike other laws that have passed, and has, some have passed um, the muster of certain courts, such as the one in Indiana, our law has no fail-safe. It has no out for a voter who can't get a photo ID to vote by affidavit or to vote by saying, I'm indigent, I can't vote. A voter who does not have a photo ID, can't afford or can't get a birth certificate, can't get a photo ID when they go to the polls, if they don't get it by Friday at 4 p.m. after Election Day, that voter is absolutely, undeniably, irretrievably disenfranchised by the photo ID law. The judge understood that. He said that's what distinguishes this law from every other, every other law that's been approved in other states. And Wisconsin, Wisconsin's having the most stringent voting photo ID requirement in the nation was an important factor in his decision. And finally, I just want to say we have, you know, on behalf of our plaintiffs and the NAACP and VOCES, we have no illusion that 
that this battle is over. I mean, this was an important victory today that voters won, that the NAACP and VOCES won, and we procured through a lot of hard work in terms of marshalling a lot of evidence and marshalling support from a lot of voters who brought the real life problems that they face. But we know that this battle is going to go on. We know that, um, that um, this victory is going to be challenged. And uh, we're fully prepared to defend this victory and to um, bring the arguments and the facts that we've brought and the experiences of real life people to whatever court um, that this matter might be appealed to. Uh, right now, we have a trial that's scheduled for April 16th before Judge Flanagan. We're preparing to go forward with that trial, um, and we'll bring the evidence there. If, 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 if circumstances dictate, uh, we'll present these arguments to whatever other um, appellate tribunals um, that we may be required to bring Judge Flanagan's decision um, to in terms of review. So I think um, I'd like to introduce um, one of our alder persons here in the city of Milwaukee who played an important role within the city in terms of highlighting the issue that voters faced. And she introduced a resolution along, I believe, with Alderman Wachowiak requiring our common counsel. You're listening to Richard Sachs. He is the lawyer for the NAACP and Voices de la Frontera talking about a big victory today saying that the voter ID bill would disenfranchise more than 200,000 voters. Today, today a judge agreed with them and issued a temporary injunction. And these opponents say that the justice has been served. We are going to continue to follow this story, have much more throughout the evening. We'll